Welcome back to another edition of The War Room, powered by Draft HQ and presented by Prep Baseball. Uh, I am your host, Shooter Hunt, Vice President of Scouting at Prep Baseball. Really excited to talk about a fascinating project that I've been wor working on for the better part of the past few weeks with regards to the draft, uh, the MLB draft, more, most specifically prep prospects and seven-figure signing bonuses. Um, a, a deep dive into who's getting paid, which guys, which states, which teams and clubs are valuing these guys highly. Seven figures, that's a lot. That's a, it's a pretty penny. So a lot of guys getting paid at that level. Um, so we're going to dive into all of that today and discuss some of the trends, what positions teams are looking for, what t positions should be valued. Um, but before we do that, I do want to Welcome on our, our special guest, the great doctor, David Seifert, does awesome work with D1 Baseball, former cross-checker, professional scout, does everything. He knows it all. He's my favorite guy in the world right now. Uh, but Seif, what's going on? Not much. Not much. Digging in with another uh, another war room with you. So it's Very Well, good. you know what? We've talked so much college recently that I had to get us on for some high school stuff. You're exposing, my, you're exposing my you're going from my strength to my weakness so, uh, <laughs> well, 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 you're just move on who cares these guys there's too much risk there's not enough upside that i feel like that's your uh the propensity coming worry about the college guys that's who teams are taking early right now but inherently there is tons of value in these high school guys early on and i, I think you've seen it for a, a lot of the teams you look you look into what the the playoffs have shown a, a lot of the upside guys, especially the frontline players who were high school picks. Um, what what was what's been your takeaway just from the prep side of things? Where are you at when it comes to the prep side of the draft? Right now, I'm at like you sent me to the East Coast Pro Games thing two years ago, and now those guys are freshmen in college, like the J or AJ Abernathy's, uh, the Levi. Levi Clark's of the world. So after I watched Tennessee, I'm like, oh yeah, I saw him. I saw him in, in Birmingham or where was I? Birmingham. Is that right? You just send me these funny it's, places. So, oh yeah. Just Hoover. We're just sticking you in the yeah, sun. Hoover. Sure thank you're, you. Thank you're heating up. So, or, or who did I see? Who are the many guys I've seen that were super 60 guys? You know what I mean? So it's a lot of fun. And I actually have to go back in my notes and like, oh yeah, that's where I saw this guy. Cause I recognize the name or the tool set or whatever it might be. So um, prep for me is I'm kind of like, toe in the water on them. So I get to see the really good ones that you, that you asked me to go see. Um, there's not enough time, obviously, um, to see them all in addition to the college stuff I have on my plate, but, uh, no, I love the preps. It's, it's obviously a much bigger gamble and, and you got to see through, you gotta, you gotta read that, uh, with those rose colored glasses a little bit deeper, mm -hmm. but, uh, preps are a lot of fun. They're exciting. It's, and, and if we look back and th this year will be the, I guess the 22 class will be the the draft or the juniors in college this year last year the 21 so looking at the montgomery's who was a super 60 guy um it, it's always tough to look at like hey do we give this guy three million dollars now or do we pay him five million dollars out of texas a&m wh wh whatever that may be um so we, we are looking at these prep spending trends so uh, what are we looking at you can see the cover art here of connor griffin max clark um two top 10 picks got paid lots of money to go do big things, high upside guys. Um, Scythe, the, the one thing, so I went back through the last four years. So really the post-COVID draft, 2020 was that five-year draft. So we're looking at 21, 22, 23, and 24. Um, so I'm just going to dive you through. 21, which actually had a ton of high school players who received seven-figure bonuses. It was 42 players were given um, – seven figure bonuses in 21 which to me was super fascinating because that was the summer where scouting could not really be done so like uh, so much happens on that summer circuit um you can think of the super 60 that you were at in 21 where i mean we were in masked up we were in wisconsin um it, it was a difficult year to scout especially high school games Yet still, 42 guys were given seven-figure bonuses. Um, there was 107 million, 107.9 million was given to the top 40 bonuses. So like that's that was a fair amount. Just to put that in perspective, the next year was 104, and, and then 108 and 23, and then down to 99 in 24 for kind of different circumstances. Just because it was a, a little bit of a down year. The thing with with 21, you had 24 guys who got two million plus. 
again, this is after the COVID stuff where like guys were masked up at Lake Point for area codes all over the place, would not have anticipated. What puts that in perspective is in 22, there were only 33 high school players who re received uh, those seven figure bonuses. And that's 33 with Cam Collier has, has an asterisk because he did go to Juco. He kind of reclassed. He was in the Bryce Harper mold. So I kind of counted him within that mold. It was also 22, a huge year up front, right? The Jackson Holidays, Tamar Johnson, Drew Jones, um, Elijah Greens. Those guys were top five picks. So like that was a ton of money up front. The, the other interesting thing, and Saif, I'll tee this up to you because it kind of brings in the college side of things. There were only seven shortstops taken from the high school class in 22. And this is one of the, the, the big things that of my takeaways. What I would have thought is there should be some slam dunk shortstops in college in this 22 class for this year. It kind of sounds like Arquette's like the one slam dunk guy. And, and we've talked about this. Do you think that there are others out there who will grab the bull by the horns and really elevate themselves this year from the college side? There are, there are a couple. I mean, but the funny thing you brought up, Arquette, the other one is Aloy. Those are the top two college shortstops, and they're both from Hawaii, and that's a yeah. prep class. So that's kind of kind of funny how that works, right? Um, but, yeah, there are a few behind him, like the well-known Merrick Houston from Wake, Wake Forest. I mean, he's probably the next shortstop mm -hmm. on the list. And you got Jalen Flores from Texas. Is he a shortstop? He's a third baseman. Um, you know, so you kind of just keep working down him. You know, Colby Shelton's part of that list, too. And I know he's a third baseman, played shortstop last year um, as he was self so, uh, You know, so there are there are some good ones, but uh, um, that is they aren't maybe the elite quality uh, that we've seen in the past overall. OK, let me let me bring up the grid just so people can see the positional breakdown. So last four years, there have been 150 prep players who have been given seven figure bonuses. Um, so reading through the list here. Right-handed pitchers were the most. 43 against shortstops were 41. So I, I would say the one caveat to that is the fact that a lot of those right-handed pitchers are a little bit further, closer to the $1 million threshold versus pushing two, three, four. Um, so it's it's teams are grabbing those that um, demographic in quantity to try right. to develop the quality. Of As it. they should with, 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 when you consider risk, when risk is so highly involved in the equation, that's probably the best philosophy to have. That's really the only one that makes a lot of sense. For sure. And, and then going into 2024 and going through our list, because we're constantly um, ironing, sharpening our skills uh, and, and pedigree of scouts with, within our organization, right? We're not just trying to predict what is going to happen in the draft. When we put up our rankings, our big board, th this is the, the uh, evaluation of the skill, the talent, and more than anything, the evaluation of the upside and the likelihood that the player will reach that upside. So that, that is something to consider when we, we do our rankings. And in 2024, of the top 25 bonuses, that were dished out to prep players, all 25 of them came from our top 41. So of the top 41 players in the country, hey, if you're going to make some money, there's a good chance you need to be on that list. Um, and, and I believe of all the, the top 25 bonuses the last four years, only one has come from outside of our top 60. Um, it, it's another good area to look at for when you're going through the draft and anticipating what players are going to come for the most or the entire part of that um of, of our top 25 the average player rank was 18.3 um of the top 10 it was 11.9 just just some data all but two guys in 2024 came from our top 75 um with the majority of them being in our top 100 and the guys who are kind of outside of that mix and looking at the way our rankings kind of shift down, they're all right-handed pitchers, right? If there's a guy who is kind of uh, the outlier of it, it's a right-handed pitcher. And as you move down the scale, Scythe, as you know, guys are pricing themselves out, right? So if you're a top right-handed pitcher in the class, you may set your number at 3 million. You may set your number at 2 million, which is why when a team only has 1.2 left, you are off the board. It bumps other guys up. So it's very important to consider signability, as always, when we talk about this. Um, but let me ask you, Saif, as a, as a shift over, the signability aspect of that. And let's stick specifically to right-handed pitchers, just because that was the demographic that I found, hey, it's a bigger grouping 
versus, hey, one through 10 on our big board. Hey, those are slam dunk prospects. Once you start getting, I would say, closer into that 60 to 150, 60 to even 200 with regards to right-handed pitchers, those guys are in a cluster. And the separation of a Jackson Job commanding his $7 million versus, hey, 100K may separate you and this guy because he's taking 100K less. We're going to take you here. Um, is, is that something that you would consider on the on the road as a scout? Oh, I think you're 100% right. And that's it's been like that. I started as an area scout in 2008, and it's been that way. It was that way in 2008. I'm sure it was that way before I started scouting. I mean, back then, though, you know, I mean, we've had inflation, but it's more inflation. The bonus goes up when Major League Baseball revenue goes up and keeps yes. going up between 8 and 12% a year. You get to the million dollars like we're talking about. But when I started in 2008, that threshold was really 250 to 350. That was mm -hmm. kind of where – you know, where your scouting director started asking you questions like, hey, well, your high school right hander, you know, the loose athletic guy with a good delivery, blah, blah. Um, you know, can you get him done for 250? Can you get him done for 300? And you're exactly right. If if you couldn't get your player done for 300, then he would go to the other area of scout. Hey, you like this, this right hander? He looks the same. Things are very similar. Can you get him done? So, yeah, in that case, you just take the best, uh, I'd say the the best deal or the best value, but that's the guy you end up taking the guy that was signable for 300. But now it's that number is a hundred or that number is a million. And yeah. It's probably going to be 1.1 or 1.2 here very quickly, you know, and that's just how the draft goes. It's, well, it's interesting. You say the 1.2, the one caveat note I put in here was for this, I did seven figures, right? Make it really super easy and blunt. I think in the future we'll be looking more at hey 1.2 1.3 would be yeah. the bottom line of like hey this is where these guys are because it's going to continue um to sift and move up um look let's look at some of the positional breakdown outside of right-handed pitchers obviously the short stops you're trying to buy athletes middle of the field athletes and even diving into tw it's 12 and 21 7 and 22 which was interesting because there were a few up top um 14 in 2023, 24 and 11, um, 11 in 2024. Not all those guys are going to stick at shortstop. A, a lot of that kind of had the athlete attached to it, um, but it's still a significant amount. And when I looking at that and doing some forecasting for 2025 site, it's, hey, pretty much you're looking at 10 or 11 of these guys are seven figure slam dunks. And up top, there are it's super talented in 2025. There's a full grouping that will help define themselves. And I think actually the 2.5 to 3 million will be very much peppered with these shortstops. Uh, it's a little not quite as strong of an outfield year, although you're still looking at basically there's going to be seven no matter what but from the outfield. Um, but shortstops wise, there are groupings, right? There's tierings, and it's something that we look at constantly, right? That tier one level, that those Ethan Holiday types where, hey, you're dictating signing bonus. Th this guy is not taking a deal because he is dictated. He doesn't you need to take a deal. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't need to take a deal versus you get down closer to, I, I think the anticipation that I had was, um, or the forecasting was more like 11 of these, or maybe 12 of the shortstops. I got to check the article. Go to prepbaseball.com. It's in the gallery. Click on it. Um, 12 of those guys, once you get down kind of those last three or four, the group gets bigger. So I know we have a listing of where our, our uh, positionally guys are, but it's not just going to go, hey, 11's getting this, 12's getting this. Hey, that 12 grouping might be 12 through 30. And now you're looking at who's cutting a deal for 1.2, 1.3, whatever it may be with regards to the shortstops. Um, I talked about outfielders here, the third grouping at 29. Again, athletes, guys who can hit. We're looking at top war guys. It may be an up the middle guy, a Braylon Payne of this last year with the Bra with the Brewers, um, or even Kendall George from last year with the Dodgers. Guys who are anticipating sticking in center field, but also you look at the WAR, and I mean, right now it's the WAR's wild place with with Otani doing huge things. But for the most part, you're looking at shortstops, right? Bobby Witt Jr., Gunnar Henderson, up the middle, even Aaron Judge you're, as a center fielder at this point, right? Riley Green, Silver Slugger, playing center field there in. Um, Detroit left-handed pitchers, which I thought last year was a little bit of an anomaly Sife at eight. Um, it, we talked a lot about it pre-draft where there was depth at the second tier. We had cash Mayfield exploded 
uh, at the Super 60, right? Turn himself into a first rounder. But guys like Boston Bateman, who went to the Padres, who was a huge left-handed arm, Schiefelbein, uh, David Shields, who was a reclass up. Um, eight next to those other years looks very intriguing. And even the five and 22, uh, it, it was a bit high. I'd say it's probably looking closer to four. Um, kind of seems like the standard. If you start there, who else can make that jump from the left-handed? What I want to get to though, Saif, and talking with you are the corner infielders and the catchers. And obviously if you're looking at the list right now, it's the lowest number, a, a high school catcher. We had four in 2021. If you take that away, it's just been four the last three years. And it's, especially with our rankings wise, the prep catching prospect is very difficult. And I think even within the top 100, top 200, if you're a catcher in our rankings, like that's saying a lot, right? Because the value is not as strong as the war upside of a shortstop where, you know, you kind of want to put more chips into that uh, or more eggs into that basket where, hey, hopefully we can get something out of this. Hopefully we get a Gunnar Henderson at pick 41 or we get a, a Jordan stuck on the Orioles right now um, or a, a Colt Emerson type, a, a Ty Pete, whatever it may be from the high school side of that standpoint. Um, but the what I'm basically getting at is it takes a lot for a catcher to move super high into our rankings, right? And, and um, I, I think even more so now, Saif, and I, I don't know if you've been following this close to obviously in the playoffs, you were definitely following this. The versatility of positionality is of utmost importance. And I don't think you can have a catcher who like, we're not sure if he can catch. He may be stuck at first base. He hits right-handed. That type of guy loses value in a hurry. Is that something that you consider? Yeah, I think I think the industry has just kind of figured out that catchers, you can find really good catchers third, fourth, fifth round, and there's really no need to overdraft that catcher unless he's a special guy. Like obviously Mr. Oregon State, you know, yeah, Rush Freeman. And this year, I think there is a special guy. I'm not sure he's going to go off the for you know, he's not one one, and that he probably not, he probably won't go in the top five or 10 picks, but Luke Stevenson, sophomore, those are from North Carolina. So um, other than him and Ike Irish is a really talented, more of an offensive catcher. But I, again, back to my original point, I just think the industry has just learned like, Hey, there's some, you you go do your homework, you know, dig in mm -hmm. the, dig in the weeds or get to know these guys even better. Um, there's some good third, fourth, fifth round ones that are just as good as that guy you want to pick, you know, with your second pick or, you know, in the comp round or whatever. So I just think the industry is getting smarter. Industry is getting changed, you know, it's changing. I think like everything else in this world after COVID or during COVID, when people just stayed at home and had to isolate themselves and crunch numbers and the analytics became so big, whatever industry you're in, you know, the world has changed and, and the draft has changed too in that regard, because there's just a lot more uh, processes going into the overall evaluation of, of any guy and, catchers kind of bear the brunt and not to keep going, but I just speaks to like, you start your ball, you, you start your club with athletes up the middle. Right. Mm -hmm. So all the talk about what we talked about, the shortstops and the pitchers that are up the middle, those are the guys who go up first. And then when you get to those catchers and third basemen, um, you know, you, you take them where appropriate. And, and if they're preps, if appropriate is a third round and they don't want to sign for third round money, those are the guys go to school and all that winds up, reducing the numbers of the guys who were ultimately chosen, you know, chosen and signed. It's, and there's still that, right? Blake Mitchell's top prospect for the Royals, first rounder. We had very high, I love the way he could hit, but he was also super versatile. He was a guy who can hop on the mound, up in the mid upper nineties, can move around the diamond, not going to be pigeonholed to hate. We have to have him behind the plate or at first base. Um, although he's off to a, a great start in his pro career, especially the second half this year. Um, but so there's definitely value there. Same way a right-handed pitcher. It's kind of like the way I was, I, probably a few years ago, talking about right-handed pitchers. Take them like running backs. Hey, grab them in quantity and see what works out. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think catching-wise, like you said, there is value you can find down the board right now, which is a huge reason for us when going through our rankings process, right? Find the shortstops up top because that's kind of where more is. And if you have a group of 20, how many are going to actually hit? right? It, the, it's really difficult to scout and, and hit on those guys, right? You have the dream Gunnar Henderson. Oh my gosh, what, what a dream pick. Foundational guy who, who develops into something huge there. Um, so you're not going to hit on every guy, 
especially yeah. now I'm talking about just our rankings. Some are going to go to school. I, I think about Charlie Bates is at Stanford right now. He was a guy high on our board where, hey, we this is where the talent level is. Probably going to go to Stanford, but we're not moving him off this talent level for our big board moving forward. Uh, but super fascinating stuff when, when diving into where the breakdown should be. And it's almost like if you had a top 100 percentage wise, this guy, this, this many pitchers, this many shortstops, it's not going to be a ton of catching prospects because it, it's just not going to be there. Corner infielders, which I actually think this year's draft forecasting wise, I, I would say it's more the versatility type corners. So when I, when I put the corner infield here, like third base, left field, they can kind of shift around, um, do multiple things. There are some really exciting ones in this class that I think will get paid Scythe. So be ready for that because ultimately what's going to dictate the war is going to be the bat and what the production is in the box. So I think at least from my perspective, the dude can hit, like you really quickly start to forget about his defensive, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you get to a certain point in the draft, right? Well, all parts of the draft. It's, it's basically, you get the positional and the versatility, like you were saying, but you get to a certain point where it's like, just rank the bats. All right. Now it's a third round. Like, I don't care where he plays. Is he going to hit? Okay. Now he's, he goes to the top, top of the board, you know, after, after day one, essentially, but you're always looking for the hitter, but I get it. And kind of to your point earlier though, too, it's like when you're, when we're ranking guys, the first 25, 30, 35 guys, you know, first they're easy, man. They just, right. And just to your point, like what we've been talking about this whole whole time is you get to a certain point where guys just that's the same guy, that's the same guy. They all kind of look the same. And and those are your, I'd say your third, fourth, fifth rounders, but there's a lot of the same. And then it becomes just a negotiation. And sometimes it's just like getting lightning in a bottle, right? I mean, that's yeah, you get, you get lucky. I mean, I, I got lucky in the draft when I was an area scout. I mean, I like the player there on my list, but like to say. I'm not saying you lie, but you, you rank them how you see them and you predict what you think they are, but guys exceed it, right? And you you like, man, yeah, I saw that coming. No, you didn't. This is what your report said, but at least he's on your list, right? So I'm kind of talking in circles here, but um, the lower down you go, all the guys kind of blend in, and then you are just selecting quality. Uh, quantity over or over quality well you talk about getting lucky there and i think that was a huge reason for why i went down this right let's try to quantify that luck let's try to find out okay where are these players coming from and right off the top i always think about the big four for from the prep side florida georgia california texas so th mm. those four right and california i think almost twice as many big leaguers, which is for a separate uh, episode. Yeah, for the, sure. The, the bonuses by state from the high school side, as you can check out here on the list, Florida had the most the last four years, 27 figure bonuses to California in second place at 17. And even more beyond that, the interesting about what Florida was able to produce, their bonuses were actually considerably higher than what California is. California had some guys like 1.2, 1.5, um, they had more of those, whereas Florida was two plus for the most part throughout. That's um, interesting. Florida. That's interesting. You think it'd be different because California has such a high state tax. Florida has no state tax. You'd figure that to overpay California than Florida, but that's just probably too much financial thinking as opposed to talent. You always, you know, go, where yeah. talent, you always go where the talent's at. So, I mean, that's why Florida has what they have, but uh, that's interesting. It's kind of backwards in the financial sense. Absolutely. And then you go down to Texas at 16, Georgia at 12. Um, now Georgia, if you took 21 out of the mix, Georgia actually came down closer to Illinois and now Illinois is at eight outside of those top four. That's when it started to get interesting to me, right? Because when you have an area scout, it's not like the Florida guy usually does not have North Carolina, right? Scythe, right, right. The Southern okay. California guy does not have Utah and Nevada. They might have maybe, maybe, maybe some, some duty, of that, but yeah, you're to your point, your point but, is but, they're covering those areas. You start going to the Midwest and the Northeast, these guys are dancing around some good pockets. So Illinois at eight, New Jersey at eight. Well, I'm going to have to fact check you in New Jersey. So after we get off here, I'm going to have to go fact check a New Jersey native throwing New Jersey up there in the in the sixth <laughs> spot. But just kidding. You're talking to an Illinois guy. So that looks great right there. Well, so what I was trying to dive into, so you start looking at those pockets, right? Where are we going to spend our time on prep prospects if that's where the most money is going to be spent? Hey, right now, for me, like I always think of Illinois. Who are the arms coming out of Illinois? It, mm -hmm. It's one of the immediate things I go to is I know these guys are good. And 
this is just seven figure guys. You step down to a six figure, a high six figure, Illinois would continue to go up because they've had some really good ones recently with regards to that. But in the jersey, now going to the area side of things, Pennsylvania with seven. Now, a fair amount of those are in the Pittsburgh area. So you start looking at, okay, who has Pittsburgh? If you're a Northeast scout, you probably don't go to Pittsburgh. But McGonagall, you start looking at the Philly kids. Yeah, you probably have that. If you have South Jersey, North Jersey, going into the Northeast, you pr most likely do have Philly from that standpoint. It's a significant amount of guys. You're talking about more than Georgia, right? If you're going 14, hey, all of a sudden the Northeast, hey, we're spending some money there. And that's what the team seemed to be doing the last four years. Missouri was clockwork it was one guy a year <laughs> like it, i'm talking safe it was 21 one guy 22 one guy 23 one guy 24 one guy um oklahoma going to add this year potentially three more at least and then next year as well um some really good guys virginia if, if, if you take out one last name in oklahoma what do you really have <laughs> but no to, to oklahoma's point that's kind of surprising though because i mean a lot of this is just population based, right? Where the people yes. are, where the process it's just simple. In Oklahoma, they only have one big city or two, I guess, in the whole state. That's just surprising that, you know, they're that high, as well as Nevada. You know, they only have really Reno and Vegas. But uh, those two are those two are the most surprising of all the others. Just it's it's a population race. Oh, it, it really is. And you find I'm sure most teams, but it's fascinating too, Syph, and you're really in tune to this with regards to area scouts. Teams don't divvy things up the same. No, and no. I covered and, 10 states as an area scout in the Midwest. Like, come on, like, yeah, that is no, it's not. And then we have four, we had three guys in southern the southern half of California. So, you're to your point. <laughs> well, I think that's what people have found here, right? They're looking at Florida and California up top. Hey, this is going to get crushed. We know we have lots of guys, famous names. If you spend some time in these cold weather states, and I think more and more teams are, um, now it like. Again, you could regionalize things. So if you put the PNW together, right? O um, Oregon and Washington, they would have four as well. They're going to add to that this year um, in, in the next coming years. So I was trying to like group it. Like how would an area scout, like I think you and I talked, if you added Missouri and Illinois together, okay, they had 12. If you put Indiana with Ohio and Pittsburgh, uh, uh, just different groupings, hey, yeah. they become pretty substantial. It gets pretty close to Florida. Now you said it. It's population-based for the most part. But the way teams kind of draw their lines, I started thinking, would it make more sense to do that yearly? Now, all of a sudden, hey, we we are anticipating 2026 having this region is really good, right? The South Jersey, Philadelphia, we have to be in Northern Virginia, that pocket heavily. Like, yeah, do we redraw the lines? I think you redraw the lines with your cross checkers. I know one, at least one club, they redrew their cross checking areas because of the new Big Ten teams, right? So they wanted to give their West Coast cross checker, um, also the Midwest. You know, they're oh, going to wow. gonna, gonna, Illinois and Indiana and Wisconsin and Minnesota, right? So it makes sense because they're all Big Ten and they can catch the Big Ten teams when they come out west and on and on. But I think if you redraw your lines too much as an area for your area scouts, I think you're getting yourself in trouble because a big part of being a successful area scout is knowing your players. And it's just not knowing that player when he merges. Sorry, I got to fly in my house here. It's cold outside. They're all coming inside. But anyway, I think a big part of being a successful area scout is you know your players. You don't know them when they're just a senior, right? You get to know them when they're when you see them at that area code tryout and they're 15 years old, or you see them at some showcase when they're when they're a sophomore, junior. So you get to know them because at the end of the day, right, you want athletes with aggressiveness and aptitude. And those Ooh. are the basic scouting, the three A's, right? Well, aptitude is not IQ, okay? It's not IQ. It's the ability to learn when taught as far as, you know, what you're doing. So love that to learn the aptitude of a player, you need to see his progress. And if you only get a quick look at him when he's a senior, you, know, you saw him in the fall once and you saw him in the spring once and you liked him, so you went back again, you brought your cross check him. That's that's a tough aptitude, right? Um, but when you're seeing these kids when they're sophomores, juniors, seniors, don't, what we do at prep baseball, right? We have all these different looks, and I think that's one of the many reasons we have great staff. But that's just another reason why we were so successful with all the numbers you cited about 20 minutes ago, where we've gotten you know 41 of the top 25, or I, I forgot exactly what you're saying. But there's a reason for the success behind our numbers. Um, and it's because we do know the players and that's what clubs get into trouble. I think when they start redistricting their, their lines so much, maybe not on the college guys, but 
definitely with the high school guys, just learning their history. Yeah, you definitely don't want to get too far away from the hotbeds, right? If that's out of your region, you're out of touch, you're guessing on some guys. But you talk about having that um, track record. And I keep thinking about, I always merge the analytics with the in-person, right? The uh, I, I really think that a ton of the analytics and the data sense that those will kind of provide, hey, this is what we're the ceiling we're looking at. This is where the floor is. And then the actual in-person action, like this is our likelihood that he will reach that ceiling. And, and I think it's so important to have that. And you talk about the early on track record, the future games, mar uh, incredible spot, right? Yeah, I, I think about Jackson, Joe, point. Jackson Holiday, all those, all those guys that we had all this track, Caden Dana, th those are all guys we had track record on for three and four years. We, we kind of saw them produce, not just in a showcase where, hey, we saw the metrics, we see what this is. Hey, now we're going to grind out. What is his plate discipline? What is his swing decision? What what are what are some? What is the likelihood that he is able to make those progressions that we need him to do? Um, that that's where the, the scouting really comes in, right? And and what do we think this guy can be? And I think of, I I keep going to Illinois, Southern Illinois, Northern Illinois, Chicago land. I um love that area because there's just so much talent in different pockets there it's kind of similar to pennsylvania where pittsburgh philly there's all these other pockets um from that scouting sense but let's take a look at the teams and who's spending so we had the bonuses by state now you have the prep signings seven figure only again by the clubs now seattle mariners with 12 the, those were the, that was the clear most i will say scythe 23, they took three in a row. They had three of the top yeah. 34 picks, and they they did hit on. And those were guys who were track record guys, too, where you had Colt Emerson, who may look like an absolute steal in the long run, um, along with Aiden Miller, the, who the Phillies were able to get super late there. Um, Ty Pete, Johnny Farmello, all guys that were awesome picks that we loved here at Prep Baseball. Um, they had 12. The Padres have done an incredible job. You think back to... Uh, the James Wood pick, the um, who, what's, uh, Jackson Merrill picks. I mean, those were sensational picks. In, in especially Merrill, yeah, especially Merrill, because he wasn't he wasn't on a lot of clubs. He wasn't on a lot of clubs top fifty, you know, or top hundred even. So, so if he um, had the twenty fifth highest prep bonus that year. Like it's that that was another fascinating thing. You know what? Maybe I'll put together a slide that actually put together which bonus these guys were at. Jackson Merrill is the 25th highest prep bonus that year. I think he had 1.7, 1.8. It's not laughable yet, but like, hey, it's pretty funny to see like, hey, some guys got twice as much money as Jackson Merrill. What, what is that conversation like? But well, now this was a little bit different year, but another guy who was at the future games. You locked in on his progression from the future games. Awesome job by the Padres. They took some guys last year. I think Kale Fountain in the fifth round, 1.7 million. That that's a huge upside piece. They've done well with those guys. The Pirates, who, I mean, it's the yearly what supplemental guys from high school is going to the Pirates. Like it's you you know it's happening every year, right? So I, I always which which recruiting class is getting blown up by the pod by the Pirates. That's that's a yearly tradition that I like to follow. Um, the Red Sox. Now, the, the one thing I do want to talk about here, and maybe you can help me with this, Scythe. Because the Royals are on here too with eight, uh, the Tigers with eight. This goes back four years. There have has been turnover, right? Scouting departments change. You have different theories and ideas come in, move around to different organizations. Um, do you think that will impact some of this and this this data moving forward? Well, I think it's all part of uh, organizational philosophy, right? You know, you know, Seattle's had the picks, Padres have had the picks, Pirates have had the picks, but Boston being on the list is kind of surprising because. You know, they're not they don't get those extra picks for being small market or this or that. And surprising they've 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 had eight and four years. But then I go back to when I was an area scout, it wasn't my area, but I mean their impetus for like the high school guys is probably Mookie Betts, right? Mookie Betts, seventh rounder, unknown guy. Mm -hmm. I would say a lot of clubs, again, this is not a fact. I just being around a lot of clubs didn't even have him in, have him in you know? So, yeah. um, but you hit on that one guy and then you get the, you get the appetite for another and another, and another, and you keep hitting on him. And you're like, okay, this is fun. So, so again, some of the most are function, just having the picks and having the money. Um, but others are just, you know, just a philosophy uh, like the Red Sox. And before the Royals started going prep, they were heavy into the college. Remember when mm -hmm. they took 18 singer and all those, those college arms up top, the kid from Memphis and uh, the, the lefty. I wish, 
wish I had a good memory. I can remember all the names, but I think they took like four or five college guys with their five top picks in 2018. 18. Yep. Yeah. So um, it's just philosophy. It uh, really is. And, and you look at teams that are doing like Baltimore Orioles too. Like, shoot, it's, it would honestly be one if they didn't have the first pick, right? Jackson Holiday is one of those two. Creed Williams, a catcher who was right at a million um, out of the out of Texas, uh, left-handed hitter. But the Rockies only have two. Astros with two. Super data driven during this. Um, the Yankees only having two. Volpe, or I guess Volpe would not be included in that because that was 2019. Uh, and then the Cardinals with two. Um, so just some fascinating stuff to to look at the data sets of where are these prep players coming from. Right up top, you're coming from Florida. You're coming from California, but. There are some cold weather states that are getting after it. Um, shout out to us, Scythe, Illinois, New Jersey, but also Pennsylvania. Um, this year, I would anticipate California adding a considerable amount. Like th that's a really good crop of talent coming out of California. Next year, when we look back at this, California may be bumping closer to the number one spot, but it inevitably, um, and looking at the forecasting of this, let me go back to the, the grid here. Um, it's kind of stays the same, right? So we're looking at like, there might be two catchers this year, right? One or two, like that's where you're going to look at, um, who are these guys? There's probably a group of six, seven, wh whatever it may be, because some are going to opt to go to school, which is a really good Avenue for a catcher, right? At, at based, based on what we've seen recently, there, there is a chance for those guys to be first rounders kind of helps out going off the school from that standpoint, um, corner infielder. I, I would anticipate a, maybe pushing closer three or four in this year's draft uh, from last year. Left-handed pitcher we talked about earlier, probably in that four range. Uh, outfielders, eh, I think six or seven, depending on what position you give to a high school guy in this class. It's going to be short stops. It's going to be right-handed pitchers. Um, as always, uh, that that's that's kind of where we're looking at for this, this upcoming 2025 draft. Um, but I do anticipate at least 37 seven figure bonuses. That's, I think that's kind of where I set the mark. Um, Scythe, I'm setting it at 37. Actually, okay. you know, let's go 37.5 over under. You have no idea about this prep class outside of uh, another holiday um, being in the mix. 37 and a half over under prep seven figure bonuses. Okay, and I'm going to give you my number at the Super 60 on February 2nd this year. Is that what we're doing? I'll give you my number after that, that event's all done. <laughs> okay, so we have the Super 60. Everybody will have to join back in, check us out. Sife's going to give his betting odds, his betting line at the Super 60, which has some really good names coming to it and some guys who are going to impact those seven-figure bonuses. I can't wait uh, for I'm everybody to you see to that. that. I'm holding you to that. <laughs> uh, but Sife, this has been awesome. Thanks for hopping on here to – dive into the data, really get into the nitty gritty, help us out and, you know, help the public actually take a look at our rankings and where guys are, because it is going back those, the four years and you can check out some of the uh, information on the website and the articles. It's a pretty slam dunk. These guys are going to come from a certain area. Now, some one right-hander will probably come from beyond. And I will say one ca uh, caveat, I don't want to call it a caveat, but this does not mean that Going off the school, other guys will not get better. And, and that's the one big thing is, hey, playing time is important. Getting that experience is important. Guys are going to get better at a different rate. So don't think that everything's dependent on the high school aspect of it. As Saif in introed us with, like, he does not care about these prep guys. Hey, all, all the talents in college. As, as, that's why Saif's always hanging around uh, UT and, and Tennessee and, and Vanderbilt. <laughs> Like, yeah, I remember this guy. Yeah. No. Um, but until next time, Saif, I really appreciate you coming on. This was awesome stuff. Be sure to check out the articles at prepbaseball.com. We are marching our way towards the initial draft board, mock draft 1.0 as well, Saif, your favorite thing in the world. Um, so be sure to check out the website. Until next time, we'll see you guys at the ballpark.